okay, what happens if we are one day able to make uh, systems that are as intelligent as humans? And, and one argument is, unless you believe that there is some kind of magic happening in the brain, then the brain is just an extremely complicated machine. One day we will be able to replicate that machine. There is no in principle reason why we will not be able to make machines that are as sophisticated as the brain. Uh, the brain we know has a bunch of limitations. One is it needs to organically grow into a host that then needs to be able to create a smaller version of itself that then grows into roughly the same size. Uh, that engineering restriction does not exist. We are able to build giant data centers that are much, much bigger than you know, the size of, of the head of a, of a child. And silicon can operate at much higher speeds than some firing neurons. And so if we're able to make sufficient advances, then we may well be able to far exceed the intellectual capacity of the human brain. And what happens if we're ever able to make systems that are just much smarter than us? What does that look like? Would we still be able to control them? Would we be able to specify ahead of time ways we want them to not behave? What if the things that they desire in the world, assuming that they have some kind of desires and assuming that they don't de develop some kind of instrumental desires, th there, is, there is something deeply troubling about the idea of creating something that is much smarter than you, that is very alien to you, that in principle, you are handing over control over the future to that system. Hi, my name is Ron Dror and this is Remake, a podcast about design systems and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, a new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Shahar Ravine. Shahal is a senior research associate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, CSER, at Cambridge University, focusing primarily on risks associated with artificial intelligence and deep learning algorithms. We discuss Shahar's unique approach to discovering truth through simulation and gaming, his insight into how to fix the broken system of science funding, and his project, in collaboration with Oxford University's FHI, or Future of Humanity Institute, and my own remake labs to create a strategic scenario game that will help educate decision makers on the possible risks and effects of the accelerating development in AI capabilities in the next few years. So now, let's get to it with Dr. Shaha Ravine. So I usually start with this question, which I, I find kind of help uh, put things in perspective. So what is something that you've believed since childhood that still drives you today? Mm, that is a big one. I'm not sure I'll be able to say it very crisply, but it's some combination of the world being a really interesting place and that figuring things out about it, doing so by making things is particularly fun. I'm thinking all the way back to playing with Legos, kind of working out physics problems, playing out in the lab, games to explore philosophical ideas all the way to now. Yeah, I think that's pr pretty consistent. Interesting. And so what, what were some of these uh, activities? Can, can you kind of walk me through? So you said playing with Legos, which I did too. That didn't make me a scientist. What are some of these activities and how, how did it kind of, that discovery of the world being an interesting place come about more uh, specifically? Yes, I guess, I guess part of it is way back in childhood was... You know, in the beginning, playing with Legos and making all sorts of different shapes and figuring out all of the kids, things that you could build, and then later on getting stuck into fantasy and science fiction, making up adventures in Dungeons and & Dragons, and kind of getting new ideas for things to build, first in Legos and then later on in various video games like SimCity and Stronghold and other kind of sandbox games. Undergraduate, I studied physics and I really liked Uh, I particularly like labs where you had to build up your setup. It was only through the setup that, I mean, I found that more interesting than the theoretical parts. I know, moving to philosophy, it got harder to learn things by building, but I really liked making thought experiments and particularly models that ex to explore ideas. Yeah, and, and that's also, I think, why I like code. It's kind of 
you, you learn things by building things. Right. That's really cool. Can you give me an example of some philosophical models and, you know, mini experiments that you, you created? Sure. I think one that I did kind of near the end of my master's, I was exploring this idea that what really drives scientists is probably not the discovery of knowledge. Discovery of knowledge is just a side effect of what they do. What really drives them is gaining some level of authority within their own field. And that seemed like a fairly weird idea, and I wanted to kind of play around with it and see if I can make it work. So I made a simulation game. I called it Sim Science, where you have a bunch of activities that you can take as a scientist, and each of these activities can kind of give you more authority, or you need a certain level of authority to do other things. So I try, try to look at authority as a currency within hmm. scientific research, and it worked really. I worked fairly well. I felt that that was a, a plausible model of thinking about the sociology of science. Interesting. And did did people could people play with this model, or was this more kind of abstract? Oh yeah, no, no. This was a game. You could log in and you put in your name, and you had a bunch of research projects that you would uh, be able to follow. I thought I went on v- very jokey. So the projects were things like, can I lick my own elbow? And looking at weird objects in puddle water and things like that. And then you could hire more staff, and you could buy uh, equipment for your lab. And I linked to some very silly videos on YouTube that were promotional videos for various bits of equipment, like the PCR song. Um, yeah, you could actually go and play it and kind of gain more authority as you go through the turns. There wasn't very much content, so after about 20 minutes of playing it, you would be done. That's fun. Did you find that it more closely replicated the world of science than, say, a pure pursuit of, of scientific truth? Yeah, I think it, I think it added a dimension that was missing from a lot of discussions. And I think there was a... I mean, this was based on ideas that were already existing in the literature and philosophy of science. Um, Philip Kitcher and Mike Strevens and a bunch of, a bunch of anthropologists before them, like Bruno Latour and others, were all talking about the importance of credit assignment. I just wanted to see if there was a way of operationalizing it in a way that kind of created a consistent system beyond kind of local, very toy mathematical models, which already existed, for example, in Philip Kitcher's work. And yeah, I, I felt that what I had in the end was something that seemed plausible to me and also helped me understand the world a bit better. I'm not saying that internally all researchers are motivated purely by having more authority in the field. I think that is not the case. I think there are many people who are out there doing research because they generally want to find out things about the world. But I also think that if you think about science as a sociological and collective pursuit, then you also need to look at kind of status and the authority of people within the community. And part of the status is entirely earned and justified, right? Some people are just kind of brighter and have better ideas and are better at doing experiments. Um, yeah, it's, it's, um, this reminds me of um, Seth Godin's book about marketing uh, that I think I mentioned to you at some point, which is all about status, right? How status kind of drives everyone uh, and the, the, the search for status and the, some people desire higher status um, and that's what drives them. Some people actually desire lower status. Uh, some people have high status and they, they, they're trying to, to, to lower it because they feel more comfortable with a low status. That's an interesting kind of uh, connection there. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think that's right. And I think it's related. I think, I think you can separate kind of good sources of status and bad sources of status, right? There is kind of right. ha- having lots of status because you speak very confidently and you use lo- long words. And there's a kind of status that comes from the fact that you've done really impressive work. And people look at it and it's like, hey, that's a creative thing that no one has done before. Um, I think within academia, well, depends which part of academia, but. I think within scientific research, there is there are many good ways of gaining status and probably still quite a lot of bad ways of gaining status. But yeah, I was looking at how does your status as a researcher, both earned and unearned, affects where can you publish and how many people you can hire, and et cetera, et cetera. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So what are some other projects where you had to build something? It was an agent-based model to explore um, how science should get funded. I took a, an existing model from the literature and I expanded it and I re- rewrote the code from scratch to, to have my, my own way of understanding it and playing around with it. And that led me to some unusual recommendations when it comes to how science should be funded. So, so, so that's another example. Yeah. Cool. 
you spend a lot of time thinking about the way we fund science, how science should be funded, and you, you wrote your uh, PhD on it. What, what drew you to that area? Yeah, I guess that's an, an unusual topic to study. And I always say that I'm very grateful for the, the institution who funded my PhD research for funding a thesis on science funding. But um, I, so, so I started in university as a physicist. I, I was kind of was going to be a theoretical physicist and, and join the cutting edge of theoretical physics uh, or experimental physics research. And I think after a while, I dropped in on some uh, history and philosophy of science lectures because that was something you could do as part of the undergraduate in natural and sciences. And I just found them, in some sense, more interesting. Uh, and I like the idea that you could learn much more and in a much more complex way about the world. And also, I like the fact you didn't have to wake up early in the morning. I got to the point where, like, okay, I know a little bit about how lasers work, and I know a little bit about what Einstein was about when he was talking about general relativity. Of course, I've forgotten most of it since then, but kind of, I got decent marks on the exams, testing my knowledge on those things. Like, okay, it's time to move on. I switched to philosophy of science. And begin, to begin with, I thought I would just do very theoretical philosophy of science. What is knowledge? What is the foundation of quantum mechanics? Uh, various things like that. But increasingly, it seemed like there was, I was still talking to lots of both family and friends who were scientists or were training to be scientists. And it seems like there were many things that were troubling them institutionally. Like people were not happy. And if you ask them, what are they unhappy about? Well, mm. funding is really opaque and weird, and career prospects are really opaque and weird, and there's all of this departmental politics, all things that don't come up to the top of your mind when you're thinking about science and the pursuit of truth. And I just found them really interesting. And I was wondering whether there was anything within the discipline that was talking about those things. And I realized that there was some, uh, mostly within... Um, anthropology of science, sociology of scientific knowledge. And in particular, I was interested in this question of how does funding and funding decisions affect uh, what we end up knowing and the happiness of individuals within the community and various things like that. And there wasn't much being written on it at the time. Um, you know, so the main mode of funding science was funding by peer review. And at first glance, that seems like a fairly sensible way. You just you know, scientists want to work on something, so, so the funding body asks a bunch of their peers to evaluate the proposal. But on the other hand, it seems a bit weird, right? Because right. all of science is meant to be this exploration of the unknown. And if you're going to explore the unknowns, and how can you know ahead of time whether a project is going to be good or not? And, and how do you compare them? And particularly with um, yeah. success rates being fairly low, like how do you compare extremely uh, talented people who've gone through this kind of all of the examinations and, and processes you have to go to become a potential PI, principal investigator, how do you compare their ideas to kind of two points after the decimal point? Right. Um, so that seems a bit weird. And then I started writing some models about that, trying to see if I can come up with a better system. Uh, and I ended up suggesting a better system, but that... Uh, what, what I think is a better system. But I don't know how much you want to delve into that, given that that is not no longer what I spend most of my time on. Um, well, I mean, we could spend some more time on it, because I think it's um, your conclusion was very interesting. Yeah, so, so my, my conclusion was that, not, not in all cases, but I think in many cases where governments are funding Blue Skies research, they should do so by a lottery at random. Uh, so you want to have some method of screening out proposals that are kind of generally not going to go anywhere, kind of, kind of cranks and doublers uh, as much as possible. Do you, don't, you want to be fairly lenient because some very good ideas are also going to look a bit crazy. But then once you have your list of kind of candidate proposals, then you should just pick from them at random instead of trying to figure out what is going to be the best. Because I mean, it's mostly arguments that say that at the point where you're trying to decide kind of whether to give someone five years to spend all of their efforts and talent looking really hard at a problem, you are really in no position to say what it is that they are likely to come up with and how the things that are going to come up with are going to affect the rest of the landscape of human knowledge in a meaningful way, which is ultimately what we care about. Um, yeah, so that's definitely, that's probably a controversial position and I can, you know, I can sort of feel, I, I understand the because I, I got to talk to you about this, but I feel like I understand some of the reasoning, but there's still a part of me that is, believes in planning and rationality. And, you know, you sh we should be able to figure out 
you know, that some ideas are more promising than others and more deserving of, of funding. So what was the response um, from, you know, I don't know, more tr- traditional people in the field or did you do you have any any response to that publication? Um, I think it was a while that it was just just silence, but uh, already in the in the published record, this is trying starting to draw some criticism. Uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate to occasionally be asked to review those papers, uh, and I try to be as encouraging as possible of critiques of, of my idea. And this is not just my idea; there have been others who have been calling for uh, a similar approach. It's been kind of a fairly small voice within the broad landscape of academia. It was interesting to kind of trace where it's come from, because it's not just from philosophy of science, it's also from science management and just scientists themselves who are unhappy with the system and from economics as well. Uh, so it was interesting to trace all of those. But w- when I've been presenting my idea in various places, uh, or, or this idea, I should say, it's not just my idea, the, the responses are mixed. When you talk to young scientists and you kind of you tell them how hard it's going to be, uh, what the success rates are for various places and, you know, how, what, the, what is the drop-off rate from the career, uh, then a lot of them think that that's actually not a, such a bad proposal. Uh, there are some senior academics who think back, like, initially they're quite unhappy because, of course, they have been sitting on those panels and they tend to think that they've, they were trying to do their best and they were trying to provide a service to the community, which I'm sure they did. I mean, I think the people who, who participate in this institution are doing it with the best intentions. But then I asked them kind of, you know, and if you look back on all of your decisions and you look at what came out of these proposals, do you think it would have mattered very differently had you chosen differently? Admit it with some humbleness that m- maybe it didn't matter so much. And, and, and maybe they, they were overly harsh or critical at the beginning uh, and they thought proposals kind of had to be kind of a perfect description of the project that was going to be. And increasingly they realized that that is just an unrealistic expectation to have because if you can perfectly say what it is that you're going to do and what it is that you're going to find out, then it's probably not very interesting anyway. But, but, but I think still there is a lot of institutional pushback. There is also this very, I think the biggest criticism, well, I mean, w- one criticism is, look, sometimes you just have exceptional proposals uh, where there are things that are clearly needed, they need a lot of funding. If we don't do them, then the field is not going to move forward. And I accept that. I think sometimes you do have those things and, and you just need to have a mechanisms for, a mechanism to, for being aware of those. On the other hand, they, they don't tend to come from either the most prestigious or the people with the best track record. Uh, also, those kind of people tend to not have particular difficulties finding funding from other sources. But also, sometimes what you need is a breakthrough that is more engineering than science. You just need to set up this giant machine. And without the giant machine, you're not going to be able to make progress. And that's fine. I'm not saying that those uh, projects should be funded by lottery. Uh, often you have much better insight into what service they're going to provide. No, not, maybe not the results that they're going to provide, but what is the gap in the experimental landscape that they're going to provide to, to answer. Um, but, but also I think there is, there is a concern that is more political that says, if we say that scientists are not in fact in, the, in a very good position to judge which projects are going to be the best ones to fund, then why don't we just let the politicians decide which projects to fund or some religious authority decide which project to fund or let the public yeah. decide which project to fund. And this would be extreme, an extremely bad idea. I think that if you're going to let any group of humans decide, it should definitely be the scientists because the, the whole aim of the proposal is to prevent a kind of systemic bias. The, the claim is that when you have a, a group of humans looking at a field of proposals, you're going to get some kind of bias. And the bias that you get from the scientists is a somewhat conservative bias towards proposals that are slightly more familiar uh, and maybe proposals that are slightly more similar to things that have been successful in the past. But that bias is, bias is much less damaging than the bias that you would get from politicians or from the populace at large or from other kinds of uh, authorities. It's just that hopefully with a lottery, you can have an unbiased system. And that also means that you cannot have a a bias or or a trend to all the things that are generally more promising. It's, I guess, the claim of the thesis is that your ability to generate true signal is smaller than your your susceptibility to bias towards these kind of less useful directions. You know, this reminds me of of how uh, startups are funded. Um, so I, I worked a little bit in the early stage funding of startups, 
and you know I've, I've met some uh, angel investors and VCs. Some of them kind of would secretly admit to you that they have no idea how to invest uh, and how to choose who to invest in, and that they you know some of them have even promoted the idea that the best way to invest is to invest a little bit in everybody uh, and then see how it goes. And they kind of basically check in and basically expect people to meet certain milestones over time. Um, and just, but just start by investing in everybody because there's just, that's, that's probably a better financial way of, of making returns. And every, every investor has stories of like missing on Uber or missing on, you know, Facebook or, miss, you know, where they just thought it was stupid because they had their own biases and that could have made their whole year or, mm-hmm. or the, whole, the whole decade. Yeah. So, so I think there is a very strong similarity here. And, and in fact, yeah. one way of looking at the lottery proposal is just saying, if you had enough money to pay all the theoretical scientists to just keep on doing whatever it is that they want to do, um, you should probably just do that. But because right. we, in many fields of science, you cannot make progress without some significant expenditure of resources, and that this is public funding, so uh, the, the funding is limited, um, and, and we want to keep it public because otherwise you have a bunch of other biases that go into the picture. Then, then, then the lottery is your, your second best option. If you can't find absolutely everyone, then at least give absolutely everyone an equal chance of being funded. But a, a big difference, I think, with the startup world is that in startups, you can give everyone a little bit of money and then wait a year or two and see if they're able to come up with a product or see if they can find a product market fit or see if they can kind of get a lot of domain experience and get some feedback on their ideas. But I think in, in Blue Sky's research, it's going to be a very long time from the point that you have a new idea of a new research avenue or a new experimental setup until you start getting meaningful results to tell you whether you're on a good path or not, before you really tried all of the options. Because the world just gives you very, very slow feedback. Sometimes you get scientific results that only give you dividends 20 or 30 years after the, the research was done. Without this ability to get relatively fast feedback, you probably just want to kind of maintain quite a wide diversity of ideas and approaches. And, and probably I mean, one suggestion of doing that is, is funding it by, by lots of Right. Interesting. And so you, you mentioned that there's this group probably of projects that just it's very obvious that they deserve and need funding. And that's the next step in in a certain line of research. Um, is there the same thing on the other side? So projects that are just clearly trying to resurrect dead theories that have been refuted or, you know, just things can be disqualified. Yeah, I, I think so. There is always some chance that someone, someone extremely bright, uh, is going to pick up a, a historical dead end and try and pursue it. But, but I think also science, science is hard, and we generally do know quite a lot about uh, the world and how it works. At least in, in certain domains, there are some areas where we just think so many people have tried approaching this problem from a fairly known range of avenues, and they have not been able to make progress for, for reasons that we are pretty good at understanding. Funding one more project that tries to do exactly the same is probably not the best idea. The people who are best able to, to point that out are people who have been in the field for, for a long time. And yes, that creates some conservative bias, which is why I think specifying ahead of time what is the necessary knowledge base or set of achievements that would be required to apply for, to, to be admitted into the lottery is probably a way of striking that balance well, you want a fairly diverse community deciding on what is that set of criteria uh, that you need to pass, right? M- maybe it's a PhD from a respected institution. Maybe it's having been published uh, in a journal that, is, that relates to this topic. Maybe it's you know, being able to solve one of the outstanding problems in the field. Yes, that you will, you're going to lose some because all of these are also institutions that, that as, as we said before, check for status, but probably globally on a cost-effective approach that is going to work out. And, and maybe you, you have some other mechanisms of funding people who, who truly have ideas that are, that are kind of off the wall and you do, who don't have any status within the community. Uh, but I expect that the return, return on investment in those places is going to be extremely low. Um, so is there anything, before moving on to the, the more current stuff, is there anything with this uh, science funding that's still on the horizon, something you're looking forward to, something that, 
or some recent developments that are interesting? So, I mean, there are three streams that I know over the world who are actively funding, like public sources that are, well, I mean, two public and one charitable, that are making funding decisions based on the lottery after some uh, prior screening from, from uh, experts. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with those. Two of them are in uh, New Zealand and are from the government. One is in Germany. It's the, the, the Volkswagen Institute. Uh, there's also, a, I think, a growing community of academics who are interested in this, who think that there's something meaningful here to be discussed. It's nice to see those people kind of meeting in various places of the world and commenting on each other's bits of, of research. Uh, I, I think I said before, they, they, we come from philosophy of science and economics and medical science and sociology. And I think having that community just come together and share ideas more regularly, as well as uh, having some of these results of real world trials come to the fore, I expect it's going to be very slow. It's a very slow revolution, if at all. But I think that there is enough sufficient momentum and sufficient discussions about this idea in, in places that can generally make decisions about this. I don't expect it to die out anytime soon, which is exciting. It's exciting to see an, an idea move from kind of the extreme edges of what might be possible to, okay, let's, let's play around with it and see if it actually works. Cool. So um, I guess let, let, let's move on to your current uh, place of employment. Uh, you work at CSER. Do you want to tell me about what CSER is and kind of explain it to people who haven't heard of it? Sure. CSER, or C-S-E-R, stands for the Center for the Study of Existential Risk. Um, existential risk in this context, meaning very roughly uh, situations in which lots and lots and lots of people die, uh, pretty much everyone. That's extinction risk, and you can get into the nuances of specifically what existential risk is. Uh, it, it's some idea of, of a permanent loss of, of value or future potential on, on a scale of the entire uh, human species or, or beyond that. Things going really bad <laughs> for humanity. We, we, we try to find scientifically plausible ways by which this might happen, and, and what can we do about them? Uh, so it's, it's both a, a research and kind of a think tank or, or action Kind of organization that also aims at action. It was founded, um, I think the official funding was in 2013 or 2014. The three founders are Hugh Price, who is a distinguished philosopher at the University of Cambridge uh, with a history in, in pragmatism and an interest in the philosophy of time and of quantum mechanics and causation and a bunch of other things, uh, but also with an interest in the future of artificial intelligence. Jan Tallinn, who is one of the co-founders of Skype, uh, so he's not an academic, and I think if you meet him, uh, you get very much get a feeling that he's not an academic, uh, which I'm quite happy about. I think the, academia has one particular culture, but it's good to mix it up with other cultures, and sort of culture is another good yeah. culture to mix in. And the last founder is Martin Rees, the astronomer royal, previously a master of Trinity College, all in all an extremely distinguished astrophysicist, uh, who has also published... Uh, both, both popular and more scientific books on potential pathways to human extinction from biological er error or terror or from nuclear weapons. He was involved in the Pagwash conferences during late parts of the Cold War uh, and also interested in the study of artificial intelligence and, as well as other risks. So between the three of them, they, they found this kind of common interest in scenarios that might lead to extremely bad outcomes from humanity, mostly looking at... Um, anthropogenic or human-generated risks, mostly through technology. So we might look at kind of anthropogenic climate change. We might look at nuclear weapons and potential nuclear war and nuclear winter. Uh, we look at risks from future developments of artificial intelligence, uh, some links between cyber threats and critical infrastructure uh, and fragile supply chains and how that might cascade and escalate into a global catastrophe. Uh, but, but also vulnerabilities to less flashy hazards that just come from the fact that our species is now extremely reliant on our technology and, and our various, various other extremely sophisticated but maybe quite fragile systems that are keeping us alive and how those might be susceptible to, to, to natural or human-generated threats. So uh, how, did you, how did you kind of find your way into uh, CSER? What, 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 was the, what was the path? So unlike most 
there's been quite a few people who who reached this community by being uh, part of a, a community or, or, or a group called Effective Altruists um, who've been reading and caring a lot about this and trying to do the most good in the world. I am not one of these, or this is not how I came into the, this uh, research. My story is much more humdrum. So I was doing my PhD in Cambridge when this center was founded. I remember going to Jan Tallinn's talk about the future of intelligence and thinking that, ah, oh, this is very interesting. Someone should, do, should be working on this, but probably not me. I'm going to be working on science funding for a while. Um, but my, I was a research assistant of Professor Hasek Chang in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, who I really enjoyed working with, a really great both individual and, and researcher. And when I finished my PhD, I went to be a software engineer for a year because I needed a break from academia. Uh, at the time, I didn't know it was going to be just a break. I thought it was for good. But then uh, Hasek reached out to me and said, hey, they're setting up this center, and I think you'll be an extremely good fit for it. And I, I had a look at, at the people who were involved, and I thought it was, uh, it would be crazy to miss out on this opportunity, given that these were people who were extremely advanced, uh, if, you, if you want to use the previous word, extremely high status in several different fields of academia. And ha had I ever tried to stay within academia in my own pursuit, maybe after a decade, I would have gotten on the radar of maybe one of them. And this was a way of getting on the radar of five or, five or six of them at one time, even just by showing up for an interview. Uh, or oh, oh, submitting my application. Hmm. So I did that. I, I wrote uh, how kind of a perspective from industry on some of these things might be good to mix in with a more academic pursuit. Uh, they liked my proposal. They invited me for an interview. It was a very uh, daunting setup because there were about eight very senior academics in a room all asking quite difficult questions. But um, no, it, it was also extremely fun. And I, I got the offer, uh, I decided this was not an opportunity I want to miss out on, even though it meant going back into academia. And I've been there ever since. Uh, it, it, it was only on my kind of first or second week on the job that I was like, okay, I better read this kind of Nick Bostrom super intelligence book that seems uh, somewhat re uh, related to what I'm going to be working on. Uh, and I, th I think fairly shortly after that, I got... Yeah quite convinced that this might be one of the biggest problems to be working on at the moment. Uh, but I didn't come into the research with that mindset. Interesting. So it was, uh, it was kind of a personal connection first that got you in, involved in this field and then got you to read the literature and then got you interested in the, in the problem. And so I definitely want to dive into AI and all of that stuff in a minute. But uh, before we do that, can you um, give me kind of an overview of um, these different problems out there and, and how you think of your, and I, I know AI will come up here, but how do you see your work today? I, I, I can try and give that. I, I, every day I start, I'm like, what should I be working on today? And it's not always, it's not always uh, clear to me. But I think the, w w we started off with the center and the, the remit was very broad, right? We just, we want to have a science of existential risk. Uh, we we want to figure out what's going to kill us. We want to figure out how to stop it. And then we need to actually get out there in the world and make sure it stops. So, so I should also say that, that our center was established after a few years after the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford was established, and they've already been going at this problem for quite some time. So we had quite a lot of, of background material to be building up on, as well as a lot of kind of specific uh, avenues of research. Right? So people have been studying asteroid risk and, and risk from nuclear war and so on for decades. Right? So this is not all kind of out of the blue start and, and figure out what you should do about this. But, but in the beginning, we had to create some of that institutional knowledge within CISO, and I was kind of the first postdoc on the ground after the executive director, Sean O'Hegarty, uh, and then a few other people joined, but we were a fairly small group at the beginning, and I really didn't come with an agenda. I didn't come with, this is what I want to study. I just felt like, I should just stu study broadly and, and then zoom in later on, so I was moving between artificial intelligence and cyber and a little bit of nuclear and a little bit of climate and a little bit of bio risk and just meeting lots and lots of organizations. Uh, if you are a fancy Cambridge uh, research center with very fancy founders, then lots of people want to talk to you. So there was a lot of just going around and networking and, and having really interesting conversations with a whole bunch of potential collaborators. 
uh, and going to a bunch of conferences and so on. Mm. And then over time, as more and more people joined, uh, there was an ability to kind of hand off different parts of the research landscape to different people. And I increasingly focused on kind of techie risks that have an active research community where some mixture of understanding the technical landscape and understanding the kind of sociology and anthropology of the research community uh, can help us make some progress. Uh, it has been mostly on, on AI, where I've been really interested to see how the machine learning community and the policy community and some of the more theoretical uh, AI safety, technical AI safety, mathematical driven community, how they all relate to each other and what they, what they have to say and where they agree and where they disagree. Um, but also in, in cyber, looking a little bit at, you know, what gets funded, what are people worried about, what are states doing, what are startups doing, uh, what might be most promising or most dangerous, what, what is genuinely ma massive risk and what is merely hype and people trying to make a quick buck. Uh, a little bit about nuclear. Uh, there was a much harder community to get visibility into, but you, at least we could get visibility into the think tanks who were doing, doing work on nuclear risk and just understanding that landscape a little bit better. Uh, and I think between these three fields, I've been kind of hoping mostly mostly on AI with a little bit of the other two. Uh, that has been my focus over, say, the last two years. Cool. It's interesting to see how much brain power and serious research and thinking ha have sprung out of uh, the UK in the area of the risks of AI. And so much of it is in Oxford and uh, Cambridge. The, the California people or the, the U.S. people feel a lot more upbeat and optimistic. Uh, and the British research feels a lot more centered around risk and how to prevent it and um, stark. Yeah, so I don't think that's entirely true. Um, I think that kind of the face of AI risk, and that's kind of mostly just an accident of, of uh, Nick Bostrom's book being probably the, the most well known about it kind of very much attaches that this idea of AI risk to um, to Oxford, but I think that there's a group, um, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute in Berkeley, in California, who are maybe some of the the most pessimistic people I know of in the world about AI risk, and probably uh, with some of the mo best recent arguments for pessimism. I, I very much appreciative of the work that they do, and I think right. there are some some worlds in which the work that they do is the only important work to be doing right now. Uh, I don't think that's the case in, in most worlds, but definitely there are some worlds in which this is the case. So I'm very happy that they are doing what they're doing. And I also think there are some people in the UK who are extremely excited and, and bullish about the technology, uh, not least um, Google DeepMind, but, but, but also a whole, a whole bunch of other startups and, and research centers. There, there is a very vivid and, and active kind of tech triangle between London with Imperial and, and UCL and, and uh, industry and Oxford and Cambridge, um, with lots of people who are doing very exciting technical AI, AI work. Uh, I also think that there are people, say, in New York, the AI Now Institute, who is um, more pessimistic and concerned, particularly with the show, the near term applications of AI, and what it means for society with issues of, of bias and concentration of power and uh, social justice and so on. And I think there are also more communities around the world, that, you know, maybe just because of, of the language um, barrier we're less familiar with, but there was very interesting work being done in, in France and in Japan and in China, um, in, in other parts of Europe as well. So no, I, I think there is, a, there is an international community, but I do think that Silicon Valley is probably the, the poster boy for tech optimism generally and AI optimism in particular, and Oxford, for other reasons, is probably the poster boy for concerns about the future of AI. But I, th I think those are kind of small representatives of maybe high status representatives of much wider and, and quite global communities. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. And there's definitely some um, some institutes you mentioned I, I didn't know. So I'm, I'm going to look into that. I, I'm sure some of the listeners will not know the, the extent of the risks or what type of risks we're even talking about. I think, um, broadly speaking, people are beginning to be aware of the risk to jobs, but maybe not the whole uh, gamut of risks. So do, do you want to maybe uh, give us an overview of 
why are we even concerned about AI? I, I'm going give, to give a breakdown of, of AI risks. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think I know other people break down the domain in other ways. But, but one way that I break this down is uh, along two axes. One is along, um, you know, how soon is the risk going to happen? And I split this into now risks, so things that we are already facing because there are deployed AI systems out there in the world. Um, again, I mean, it depends on what your definition of artificial intelligence is. But I think m most people will accept that there are already artificial intelligence systems out there in the world that, that are causing various risks and also harms. Um, then you have near-term risks, which are, kind of, again, on my definition of things that these are systems that if you take someone who knows the cutting edge of research very well, they will have a pretty good idea of how to make such a system in the world. But we are still several years, at least, away from deploying those systems at scale in the world. Because you need to pull, pull together the funding, and you need to pull together the data, you need to find product market fit, and you need to pass through various uh, types of regulation in some of these cases. And maybe there's a bunch of, of R&D work to kind of tailor a particular solution. But broadly, we think that these are things that can be done with machine learning or, or, or right. more broadly with AI. We just quite, haven't quite done them yet everywhere. And then there are long-term risks. And these are the types of things that people kind of people at the, at the cutting edge have deep disagreements about whether we will ever be able to do with machines. But there is at least some people within the community uh, with good credentials who say, no, this is generally a thing that could happen. And if this happens, it's going to go very badly for us for various reasons. Uh, and then they give reasons and then they try to deal with those risks. Most part, partly because I think we, we need a, a long lead time uh, to deal with them. Because if you only start dealing with those problems when they are near term, then it will be too late. Uh, and another axis is an axis that separates um, accident risk. So this is the system that you've built, your AI system is not working as intended. And because it's not working as intended, various harms are caused. Uh, there are misuse or malicious use risks, which is the system is working perfectly as intended. It's just allowing some people with less than perfect intentions cause harm in the world. And these are things that could not have been caused uh, or, or could not as easily have been caused without uh, access to artificial intelligence technologies. And finally, there are systemic or structural risks that uh, come about not because the any one particular system is malfunctioning and not because any one individual has poor intentions, uh, but rather because many systems interacting with many people uh, lead to some kind of collective harm that we would have liked to avoid, and maybe with better design or better foresight, we would have been able to avoid. Uh, and this, this, this uh, three-part distinction has also been explored very well by a paper by um, Defoe and Zwetlut in Lofer, uh, which I would recommend. So what, what are some examples? Right? So we now have nine uh, quadrants, right? Three kind of ne now, near-term, long-term, and, and accident malicious use and systemic or, st or structural. Th that gives you three by three is nine. So some, some examples in each of these boxes. Accidents that are already happening now, Tesla's on autopilot crashing into vans that they fail to detect. And mm. you could say, okay, that's, that, that's bad. That's an accident with a system that's deployed other in the world. Tesla says that their systems should always be supervised and the driver should always pay attention. But then they call the system autopilot. So there's some mixed messaging there. And we, we might want to ask, well, should Tesla have been acted better in that space? But we could also ask, well, overall, do these systems have less accidents than humans? Because humans also end up in right. car accidents. Uh, in terms of near term, kind of now misuse risks, we're all getting, we are getting to the point where images of faces generated by machines of people that have never existed are being used to create fake profiles online. Uh, this is not massively widespread, but this is something that we might want to be paying attention to. And kind of immediate systemic risk, I often talk about the extent to which there is hype around AI right now. So if you put the word AI into the description of your startup, you're more likely to get funding, even if there is not much uh, technical or intellectual progress behind the scenes. And this kind of distortion of the funding landscape and the attention landscape means that some really important problems are not getting as much attention, right? So I, I would say the same of blockchain. Uh, I think there is more substance behind uh, AI than there is behind blockchain. But, but in both cases, 
these are not technologies that are going to fix all of our problems in the next two years. And so we, we need to keep our attention spread across a wide range of, of issues. Then if you move into near term, these are, I mean, we're seeing some really interesting developments coming out of labs at, at Facebook and Google and DeepMind and OpenAI and others where they're really kind of pushing the envelope on what we can do in terms of language understanding and, and language generation, agents that are able to, to navigate various worlds, currently mostly game worlds, in an um, unsupervised independent way based on some reward signal. And there is a question of what happens when those become products. We don't quite know what those products would look like, what we can sit down and start imagining what these products might look like, and then what happens if those products misbehave, right? So what happens if we're able to have way more um, household robots and online chatbots that are mostly generating a lot of value and making their lives better, but these are either misused for manipulation or physical attacks, or they just have a bunch of accidents because they are not sufficiently safe uh, in some safety-critical domains, um, and then we start also talking about systemic risks such as unemployment. But then I guess w what you really wanted me to talk about was this kind of long-term risk. And in the long term, uh, some people are asking, okay, what happens if we are one day able to make uh, systems that are as intelligent as humans? And, and one argument is, unless you believe that there is some kind of magic happening in the brain, then the brain is just an extremely complicated machine. One day we will be able to replicate that machine. There is no in principle reason why we will not be able to make machines that are as sophisticated as the brain. Uh, the brain we know has a bunch of limitations. One is it needs to organically grow into a host that then needs to be able to create a smaller version of itself that then grows into roughly the same size. Uh, that engineering uh, restriction does not exist. We are able to build giant data centers that are much, much bigger than uh, you know, the size of, of the head of a, of a child. And silicon can operate at much higher speeds than um, some firing neurons. And so if we're able to make sufficient advances, then we may well be able to far exceed the intellectual capacity of the human brain. And what happens if we're ever able to make systems that are just much smarter than us? Uh, what does that look like? Would we still be able to control them? Would we be able to specify ahead of time ways we want them to not behave? What if the things that they desire in the world, assuming that they have some kind of desires and assuming that they don't de develop some kind of instrumental desires, uh, that those are in line with what we want? This is often called the alignment problem. I'm probably not doing a very good job of explaining it. But th there, is, there is something deeply hmm. uh, troubling about the idea of creating something that is much smarter than you, that is very alien to you, that... In principle, you're handing over control over the future to that system. And so you need to be extremely confident yeah. that things are going to go well if you're going to build such a system. And then, the, I mean, Nick Bostrom's book is, is all about exploring why is that something that is a plausible concern? Why are many of the kind of gut reactions for thinking about why this is not going to be a problem at all, right? We can raise them as children and we're pretty good at making our children kind of have things that go well for us. And why don't we just make big buttons that make it so that we can always shut them off whenever we want? Uh, and why would we ever think that those things would want things that are different from us? Or why, why would they even have desires of their own? And he goes very carefully through all of these arguments and says, look, there are some fairly good reasons to think that uh, they are, these are not going to be malicious entities, right? By and large, they're going to be artifacts of our own making that are going to try and fulfill whatever it is that we ask them to do. But going from a goal description to actions in the world that are in fact in line with what we want those, action, those agents to do is a very hard research problem. We don't know how to solve it yet. Uh, we may not be able to ever solve it or at least be very confident that we have solved it. Uh, and if they are not pursuing precisely what it is that we want, they're pursuing what they want, which is just a very close version of what we want, but not precisely right, then the world is going to end up the way they want it, not the way we want it, because this is what intelligence is. Intelligence is just is the ability to shape the future based on your desires, given whatever is av at available to you. And, and so this could just end up going very badly for humanity just because of these kind of small differences between what we want and what we eventually get. Yeah. So, so I find that, you know, it's, it's really difficult to make people 
not go to the science fiction scenario, right? And where like, oh, you're talking about evil robots taking over the world or becoming conscious and evil. And, you know, I've been struggling with how to how to explain it because obviously I'm also uh, writing my thesis on this and kind of this is something that I really care about. And the, the best way I found to kind of frame this for people is to say, hey, you know what? AI is the first time that we're building a machine with no steering wheel, wheel at all. Like there's no direct control. There's no mechanism to directly control the thing. By its very essence, it's going to make its own decision. And so if you kind of bring it down to that level and you say, just like the car, for the first time we're building a car that, that makes the decisions on, you know, you, maybe you tell it where to go, but it makes the decisions. Now everything is going to be like that. You know, the grid, the smart grid is going to manage itself, right? The, so we should be really, really sure that it follows our intentions precisely and that we're aligned that those intentions are good and don't have any unexpected consequences because it's just going to take it off and go run with it you know i, f- I find that people on un- that that frames it really nicely for people they're like oh yeah all of our machines to this point we had a direct control M- more or less i mean y- you could ask who has the steering wheel for the internet who has the, st- the steering wheel for the stock exchange no but yes but when you get to that level of of societal uh, scope you're right but every single internet user is directly controlling what they want to do, right? Or is directly, and so it's almost like asking, how, you know, where's the steering wheel for society? But I find it really interesting. And so w- there's there's some interesting work on alignment and how to prevent these things. So how do you deal with the bridging the one part of your work, which is identifying these challenges, and then another part of your work, which is trying to find solutions or trying to promote existing solutions that seem promising. So how do you bridge the, the, these two parts, like the, the more kind of pessimistic part and the more optimistic part? In my day job, I'm not one of the people who, who are actively searching for solutions. I'm glad that those people exist. Uh, I think I'm, I'm much more of the kind of going around trying to build bridges between the different communities. So the communities who are worried, worried about uh, near term and communities are worried about the long term, communities are worried about malicious users and communities who are worried about systemic risks. Uh, I try to find gaps, right? So if there are risks that relevant communities are just not paying attention to, then you know, organize a workshop, uh, make introductions, uh, collate information and put it in a paper that is in the language of the target audience. Th- these are all interventions that I've been mostly focusing on. And there are various ways of doing that. Uh, I think th- one, of, one of our more successful interventions has been in collaboration with many other partners, including in in Oxford uh, and elsewhere, was the publication of a report on the malicious use of artificial intelligence. And that came from from a workshop that we convened, uh, because I think at the time, there was mostly this kind of either focus on short-term accidents and uh, some of the systemic effects, and this kind of very long-term accident risk. But there wasn't as much discussion about the kind of near-term malicious use uh, and so we brought together AI researchers, but also people from cybersecurity and people from military analysis and people from law enforcement. And that, that was a, a really fruitful workshop that led to, to a very large report that has since opened many conversation channels with um, companies and with governments and with other in other venues. And um, so, so that kind of very academic kind of get a bunch of smart people together and ask them at the beginning, quite naive questions and then increasingly more sophisticated questions and then share their answers as widely as possible uh, is one kind of intervention that has been proven quite useful. Another one is to try and then think about what kind of institutions would you need to have in place and how would they be funded and how would they have the right kind of status and prestige and how would they have the right kind of talent uh, to be able to address these problems so that we're always ahead of the risks. And, and part of it is kind of doing a lot of these mapping exercises and, and kind of community building and bridge building. But another part of it is just doing a bunch of foresight and letting people kind of inhabit the future for a while and try to understand that these are not different buckets of risk that don't, don't interact, but are in fact all part of what is going to be our, our future experience with this technology. Uh, and there are various kind of some of them more dry and some of them more fun and gamey ways of exploring those features. Um, which I guess is a great segue to uh, 
uh, to the next uh, question. So we, we actually met at the Augmented Intelligence Summit in California, which was just a lovely conference uh, with a lot of really smart people dealing with these issues. But you actually were part of this organization, of this conference, and, and you ran a, a fascinating type of uh, game, role-playing game, that is part of what you're doing these days. Do so you want to maybe describe that game and kind of what led to, to its creation? So the, the idea behind the project was that there is a lot of focus on the technical and technological side of AI risk, right? We want to understand what the technology does, what it's going to be able to do, how that's going to affect a bunch of other systems, who's going to regulate it as well. We're focusing on the technology. Um, but of course, until we get to the point where the technology itself become an extremely powerful agent that, that controls the future, if that ever happens, it's going to be humans and groups of humans and organizations and institutions who are going to play in a key role in the strategic landscape, right? What technology gets developed? When does it get deployed? Right. Who is going to manage the responses of this technology, etc.? And so it seemed that there was a lot of need to move the attention a little bit or increase the literacy of people concerned about these issues to the actors themselves and not just keep it kind of in a very abstract, you know, companies and states, but, but it, particularly if you're looking at kind of the fairly near and tangible future, say even the next five or 10 years, think about individuals, right? Think about specific institutions. What is Google going to do? How does Google make its decisions? How do, how do the president and CEO of Google make their decisions? What it is that they care about? What actions can they reasonably take in the world? And what are some things that they just cannot take because of institutional constraints? How does the US government going to respond to those things like that? How do individuals within the US government going to think about some of these risks and what are they likely to do? And the same for the Chinese government and Chinese tech companies and various actors in Europe, like the European Union and the European Commission. Um, and what do various publics and NGOs and other techs and other industries, and again, the people and the organizations, how do they see the technology developing? And there are a bunch of tools that already exist. They're called, um, they're, well, there are many tools. One of them is role-playing games, where you just take people and you tell them, okay, for the next period of time, be it an hour or four hours, you are going to try and pretend to be this person in this situation and to the best of your ability, occupy their perspective and try and take actions uh, and make statements from their perspective as the technological and social landscape changes around you. This role-playing game or, or AI strategy scenario role-play, I don't always call it a game, though it is in fact a game, um, is modeled on uh, military war games. It's modeled on tabletop role-playing games such as Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's modeled around a bunch of scenario planning exercises from, from business, but it really tackles some of really big strategic issues. Right? What are going to be um, industry government relationships? What are going to be relationships between different tech companies? What are going to be the relationships between individuals within those organizations? Uh, some civil society roles such as um, labor unions, etc. How are these all going to operate? Given that what is driving these individuals may be fairly limited or parochial, right? They might just care about kind of making more money for the family, or they might care about their particular legacy, or maybe they are motivated by kind of grand altruistic ambitions. And, and the mixture of the very personal with the kind of large strategic kind of globe encompassing changes, I think creates for uh, a very interesting experience, but, but maybe you can say more about how, how you found the particular experience. Yeah, it was uh, it was fascinating. So I, we were um, divided into groups. There was this big hall, and we were divided divided into different tables, and we were each given a theoretical scenario. So one of us, so our group was given the scenario of uh, autonomous vehicles just became you know a reality. They're approved by the regulation, and you know several big companies announced that they will no longer employ human drivers, and that includes. Uh, Uber and Lyft and, you know, shipping companies. And basically we're about to have just a massive set of layoffs um, for for drivers, Mill millions, right? T ten, uh, potentially tens of millions. Um, and we were each assigned 
uh, a role, or we actually got to select our roles. Um, and so there was the president of the United States. Uh, there was uh, the uh, president, I think, of a, a few people of different different car companies. So there was uh, the head of Tesla. Uh, there was the head of uh, the uh, Chinese uh, smart car company. Um, there, there was um, kind of a, a labor le- uh, organizer uh, who was radicalized by this. Um, and I got to be, uh, I, I was sort of the union leader. Um, and, uh, and what was really interesting is right before the game, uh, the moderator took me aside and said, okay, one thing that the rest of the team doesn't know is you're actually super corrupt and you're getting a lot of money from the car companies and, you know, your whole purpose is to kind of let them go easy, maybe arrange a sort of deal where they get some minor compensation, uh, the drivers and, um, you know, you just, you're trying to kind of not uh, not cause a, ruck, a ruckus for the car companies, even though you're the labor leader. Uh, and that kind of put a whole new spin on how I approached the game because I was going to play it very straight. Uh, and I, I felt like I, for the first time, actually had an insight and understand corrupt officials because, and there's plenty of corrupt officials around today that, that this is highly relevant. Uh, but I started kind of weighing my words, uh, not for their truth value and not for how they represent my ideas, but where they position me on the board to get to my goal, which is actually the opposite of what I was saying. Um, and, uh, and there's just a way of speaking that I started getting into as, as, uh, as a corrupt union leader that, that felt real. It felt like, okay, this is really how people in these roles who are corrupt are operating. Um, you know, they're always masking. There's always one goal, and then the the words kind of go in another direction, but still get them closer to their goal. Um, and I, yeah, I felt like I, I gained a lot of insight. And in the end, the, the the end of the scenario was not so good for for the drivers. Um, you know, I think they got you know they each got like ten thousand um, dollars, you know, compensation and like two credits, like at a community college or something. For, uh, and you know millions of people losing their jobs for this, and with with really no no plan. Um, and and the other insight is, of course, like how our human frailties are going to play into this, right? Is is um, you know one person being corrupt could affect the whole outcome of of the scenario, um, or one person just thinking of themselves or or being a little bit self-aggrandizing or not really kind of having their heart in the right place could really affect the whole outcome. Um, so yeah, I, f- I found it super valuable and, uh, and I can imagine playing different scenarios, really, you can start getting a lot of insights about what's driving different people. Um, and with a little bit more preparation and research, really, I mean, this could be one of the best tools for learning. Um, so did, did I sell it? Did, did I convince you, Shahard? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I love the way, the way, the way you describe it. I, I, I still think that to date you have had the best experience out of anyone who has ever played the game. Uh, simply because I, I think it's partly because you were extremely fortunate to have as a moderator, one of the smarter, smarter and more competent people in this community who cares about this long-term AI risks, who, who, who very, very fortunately for us has now a fairly senior position in the partnership of AI. So he was, he will continue uh, making the world a better place. But I think even if you are not, so, so one thing is to just get empathic understanding of people in positions of power. Uh, and that's something that I, I drive for a lot. And sometimes I succeed better at this and sometimes less well. But another one is also to get a better systemic understanding of how all of the different systems interlock. Um, what, what, what is it that kind of elected officials aim for and what can they in fact achieve in a given period of time? Because often we want them to just fix all of the problems for us, whereas the, their ability is quite limited. Uh, what can you do as a tech company? Um, sometimes we want them to give us, you know, perfect product for uh, zero cost. And that is also not a thing that they are able to provide, uh, regardless of how altruistic their intentions are. And it's just, to me, as someone who's run quite a few of these, and, and, and I, in most games, it is not such a localized scenario, though I think that version of the game is also extremely useful and maybe even more useful for uh, empathetic understanding. 
a version that I often play is starting the not too distant future, uh, maybe 2024 or 2028, um, and then play one year or two years per turn until you, until you, as you, as you go through some of these kind of near term technologies that are foreseeable and then some more advanced technologies and then often all of the way to, uh, at least having the ability to create machines that are as smart as humans in, in many domains. And a question is often asked, you know, how, well, we, we often ask ourselves, how are these going to play out? I think in many of these scenarios, things don't go well for humanity. Uh, and they don't go well for humanity without right. anyone being particularly evil. Right? It's mostly short-sightedness um, and you know, trying to go for the next election cycle or for the next uh, best-selling product. Usually a lot of mistrust, either between states or between um, companies or between companies and states that prevents the negotiation of really very achievable uh, co cooperative strategies that would generally benefit everyone. Um, and so these highlight kind of the importance of foresight, the importance of trust, uh, which, which then feed back into some of the more kind of may, maybe less fun, but, but more rigorous and academic work that we also do, uh, in exploring mechanisms for trust building and potentially plausible, uh, binding treaties around this technology. But, but then of course, any suggestion that we have, we can then throw back at the game and ask, okay, if you play a scenario around the negotiation of this particular treaty, but you bring in all of the kind of empathetic understanding of what individual actors want and need, is this going to work? Um, and often the answer, the answer is no, or, or no one unless you design the, the experience of, of building trust in, in a very kind of human-centered way, which is not often what comes out of kind of just doing pure uh, this, um, mechanism design. When you understand that uh, the next phase, whatever whatever it is of humanity, has to emerge from the current phase, right from the current, and the current phase is so deeply flawed, it's almost impossible to see how it would go according to our best case scenario. It's it's not gonna go. It's not gonna go according to our best case scenario, uh, and we're very lucky if it doesn't go according to our worst case scenario. I, I'm not sure I'm that pessimistic. I, I, I do think that, that people can rise up to the challenge. I think there are many people who, who, who wear the altruism on their sleeve. I think increasingly there are many of them in high power positions. But I think it's going to be hard. I think as the world becomes more unequal, as a bunch of new technologies allows you know, for new ways of communicating that are not necessarily truthful or conducive for understanding being the kind of what gets you popularity and votes, that's a tricky world to navigate. Um, I don't know. I, yeah. I still have faith in humanity. I think we're a pretty, pr pretty pliable bunch. Uh, and if you, you know, if the, if the threat, threat is very real and very present, then people can rise up to meet it. Whether we do it in, t I mean, I don't think we're going to get our best case scenario simply because best case is just an oversimplification that probably fails to include everyone's values. I think, I think we'll get something workable, but only if we put in the effort of trying to understand what the future is going to look like and, and, and respond carefully to it, right? I mean, I imagine that we will probably manage to deal with the ongoing climate change and, and the resulting climate crisis, but I imagine we will be able to do it because many people are devoting their entire careers and, 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 and social lives and so on to making that change happen, right? So, so I, th I think we can get there, but only if we put in the work. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's definitely true. With climate change, I, I can see how millions of extremely smart pe people who care deeply are getting together, both on the research and science front and the technology front and the funding front and the policy front. And something's gonna, something's gonna move the needle. And, um, you know, so I'm actually, pretty optimistic about the climate. What scares me about the situation is, actually, you, uh, you, na you named it perfectly. I never heard the, the, the term before, but uh, epistemic risk is kind of uh, something I heard from you. But the idea that, and, and Yuval Noah Harari speaks about this a lot, but the, the idea that we could so easily be manipulated to not know the truth 
or to kind of start building uh, a set of beliefs that are not true by systems, really people and systems that are hacking into our basic instincts, right? Or they're basically manipulating us. Um, Yuval Noah Harari speaks a lot about like the machines and businesses will be able to know you better than you know yourself. And that's a kind of a point of risk where you no longer control yourself because they can they can manipulate you better than you can moderate yourself. What what do you think about that risk? You know, yes, so, so we have an ongoing uh, project on that as well. Uh, as you said, it's called um, Epistemic Security, and it came out of a series of workshops that we ran, kind of as a follow up to the malicious use of AI report, where we identified in the report we call it um, political security or political risk, and that's really the idea that. These technologies may well enable various kinds of um, manipulation, surveillance, deception in, in scales and uh, that are much bigger than we've seen before, in costs that are much lower than we've seen before, maybe in ways that are very hard to detect. I think we have radically changed our technologies by which we come to know the world several times in the past. Right? We, we went from mostly oral communities to uh, print-based communities to uh, telegraph and then radio and then television-based communities. I think each of these changes came with very massive social upheavals uh, and they were very hard at the time. And I think they create an uh, period in which things are extremely uncertain, populations are extremely susceptible to manipulation. I think they undermine a bunch of power structures, many of which are extremely useful power structures that provide a lot of critical services. So I think it, it creates a period of risk as, as you adapt to the new situation. I don't think I'm quite as worried as Herb Lin, who recently published this, this okay. paper on um, cyber-enabled information warfare, where he's looking at the future of this and he's extremely pessimistic. He sees this to be the end of the Enlightenment. Uh, and, and the idea that there is just Wherever there is public discourse, there is just chaos. There is, there is no mapping between what people believe and say and, and what is actually true. I think that this is not an inaccurate description of a period that we might go through. I think we will get through it on the other side. Uh, a big part of the epistemic security work that we've done is to ask, how badly are things going to go if you assume that public discourse is just chaotic, right? That there is no... I mean, there are, there are some sources of truth, but they are drowned out by other voices who are just able to replicate things that look like the truth, but are in fact just uh, made up to try to push a particular agenda, make a profit, get elected, generate violence, whatever. I think that the answer is more nuanced, because I think a lot of the things that are really critical for keeping us alive, that are human systems that require information, have slightly separate information systems. So if you think about national security, law enforcement, uh, health and medicine, environmental protections, these are systems that, well, the state has its somewhat separate information gathering and sharing system, right? They don't rely on tweets and social media by and large, uh, nor do they rely on, on televised reports, right? They rely on kind of reports generated by government, from sources, by people who have gone through many years of training, and those are systems that are quite slow to change. On the other hand, these systems are also subject to intervention from elected leaders who are very much susceptible to these kinds of uh, yeah. social media and other forms of uh, public discourse. They are staffed by individuals who, in their spare time, probably go on all of these social media and other places wherever the service providers interact with the public, whether it's when you walk into a police station or an emergency room in a hospital um, or visit a park, you bring in that chaos of beliefs with you to that interaction. And so I think there, there are a bunch of kind of stopgap measures that the, the state and, and other critical providers can put in place to at least try and minimize the damage as we go through this fairly chaotic period. I imagine that there is going to be harms generated. I don't think it's going to be the end of civilization or society as we know it. I do think that there's going to be a period of, of, of heightened risk, and some of those risks might end civilization or society or humanity as we know it. And we should be mindful of that and try, try and deal with the worst case scenarios. 
which which is why I think this is but more attention. I think it it is one of the potential global catastrophic risks that are that we are facing. I like the fact that it is probably temporary, right? I think that there will be technical and social innovations about how we trust and what we trust and how do we empower individuals using technology so that they are less manipulable. There are some hard limitations. I mean, the fact that the technology around us outpaces the pace with which we can change people's minds um, is a worrying one. Right. So there probably will need to be some kind of, of race dynamic where you also have technology at the individual's disposal. As I said, I think humans are adaptable and extremely creative. I don't know what the solution is going to look like yet, but I think as in the past we have found ways to re- reconfigure, reconfigure our epistemic landscape, we will be able to do so again. Hmm. That's interesting. And, I, and I, I tend to be fairly optimistic uh, generally about humanity and long term, I'm still optimistic. But the question for me is, how do we protect the people who are not able to protect themselves in terms of the kind of brainwashing that we're seeing on the, on the news, fake news, uh, manipu- uh, r- really kind of deep manipulation, some of it done intentionally, some of it done just by sheer algorithms who are optimizing for engagement. And, and how do we protect these people uh, f- effectively when they, there's something about the human emotional core that is drawn to this kind of stuff, is drawn to the, the exciting lies and, and doesn't want to hear the truth? Well, one of the things to say is some parts of the truth are malleable and many perspectives are valid. And you want to be extremely concerned about a kind of, of paternalism that just says that you know what is the best truth for everyone and they should only believe that because that that is both a bad idea and historically has been a very bad idea and also if that is your position you tend to, to lose any potential trust that you could might have had or any potential engagement that you might have had with the people that you say you want to quote unquote protect um on the other hand right if you look at things like people being targeted by um phishing and and spam and malware and so on the answer is you bake the security protections into the tools that they use, right? So you, you've already given them tools to empower them. You also make those tools be able to detect falsehoods, right? If there was a, a plugin to Chrome that could uh, put a red, red uh, border around videos that, are, that you know were generated by machines uh, and not authentic ones, then you could roll that out and people can then choose to ignore that red box or not. But at least there is a very clear visual cue and you, you just go to the source. Right? You know that everyone uses one or two or three browsers. And so you just make that consortium of browsers agree to a certain set of rules. Um, in the same way that in journalism, we have a set of rules about what you report. And as long as people stick to them, then we keep a certain bar on, on what is true or not and what is out there or not. Right? There are quite a few... Despite how much we talk about everyone can communicate with everyone in this world, there are quite a few channels by which most people get their information. And I think that, that, that Google and Facebook and, and Twitter are increasingly aware of this problem and are, and are trying to find solutions that, on the one hand, kind of respect the autonomy of, of the users and the, the creators and so on, but on the other hand, uh, address some of the more systemic issues. At least when, when things are clearly malicious, uh, I think they're increasingly uh, applying tools at their disposal. And it's a very hard uh, trade-off to make because you're always going to upset someone, either because you allow content that upsets people or because you shut down voices um, that really shouldn't be shut down because you want the diversity of voices. So that's one thing. Another thing I think is it is still the case that face-to-face engagement and information that is coming through your own community, I think, has much higher salience to people than things that they read online. Um, we just don't bother going to talk to people who don't think the same as us. Uh, I think it's very easy, much easier to go and complain online about the people who f- don't think like us than it is to try and find them out in real life and meet them for a chat over coffee. And I think more of that would probably be good. In I mean, it's hard work and it's not a product and you probably can't make a lot of money out of it. <laughs> but it's, it's going to make the world a better place, uh, which is why, you know, Whenever I can, I try to take speaking engagements in places that are not high-prestige academic venues. 
and maybe I could do more of that. But this is also something that I encourage other academics to do. Interesting. I think. I think there are very strong incentives in academia to only talk to other academics who already think mostly like you, because you know then that's the status that you care about. But that's not what's going to make the world a better place. And and I don't know. I think, I think I've seen this uh, documentary about um, people in Israel who go and talk to people who are suspicious of vaccines or who are concerned about the side effects of vaccines. And these are people who, you know, instead of trying to bombard them online with studies and making fun of them behind their back on various Facebook groups, try and, you know, hold a meeting in someone's living room and listen carefully to their concerns and where possible try to confront these concerns with um, studies and in some places admit that some of these things are genuine concerns, but some of the, you know, the risks of not vaccinating are even bigger concerns that they are just not things that have been discussed very much because it's not very salient to us the kind of harm that not vaccinating your child can cause because you know there, there are various diseases that are really very 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 dangerous uh that we just don't you know we just don't know that much about them because the last three generations have vaccinated against them right. uh and so and, and i think that you know when it, when you're sitting in someone's living room and you listen to them and you hear all their concerns you acknowledge that most people just want to be good parents and you know make sure that their children grow grow up to live to be healthy adults uh we all want the same things Th- then you can have a much more constructive discussions about you know how do you gauge the trustworthiness of various sources and what are some risks that you know are real and what are some risks that aren't and what are some perspectives that maybe you haven't considered before i think that those are extremely meaningful engagements and, and not something that you know facebook and twitter and youtube are going to kind of wash away anytime soon it's just that most of us don't bother to do that so maybe there could be a solution around encouraging more of these conversations that definitely uh, sounds like the more promising path um that's really cool so um i have two set of two questions left for us to kind of think about and and um this, these, this is an adaptation for uh, for a, a questions that I actually ask in a sprint, in a design sprint. Uh, but I, I find it's a, kind of a great way to kind of look into the future. And I'll make this longer term for you. Usually it's a two, you know, two year vision, but I'll, I'll make this longer term. And I'll ask you, if you put your most optimistic hat on uh, for us as humanity and, and the next 10 years, just go perfect and just go in the right way on you know these existential risks and especially in on ai everything goes the right way what does the world look like in 10 years <laughs> um it's funny i i mean i'm very much anchored so, so i i got to play my own uh, scenario role play um earlier in the week uh i usually facilitate but there's another person who's now facilitating uh uh, Ross Goitzmacher, I think is how you pronounce his name. He's a really, really cool dude. Um, and, and, and so he, he's facil- he, he facilitated he, or he moderated the game, which meant I got to be a participant after many, many games in which I only got to be a moderator. And, you know, I just got into the role of, of Xi Jinping, the mm-hmm. president of China, and just tried to make things go well. Uh, and, and by and large, they did. I, I'm just going to kind of give you examples from things that went well in that particular game. Mm-hmm. I think that if we can get some international treaties uh, that are meaningful and enforceable around reducing emissions, cyber and information influence non-offense, so states mostly leave other states to run their own uh, affairs, particularly ones that are extremely capable of of, uh, interfering both with digital systems but also with information systems, uh, reinforce and improve our, our nuclear treaties. Yeah. That creates an environment where you can have much. Well, a we, we would have set up uh, a landscape in which we will we have much more room to maneuver and explore things in in a more careful, uh, guarded fashion. Uh, and within which we can also really start deploying some very very impressive stuff. I think it is the case. The more abundance there is. And to some extent, also, the more equal that abundance is distributed, the more people's lives go well, uh, and the more flourishing you have, and the more um, less competition and less violence and less strife happens. 
And I think much of that abundance uh, can be unlocked. Uh, I think we can grow enough food for everyone. I think we can provide enough shelter for everyone. I think there is enough um, water and meaningful activities to be pursued, um, et cetera, et cetera, for really things to go very well for most people. What we've done with the Millennium Development Goals suggests that when we coordinate globally around those tasks, things can go very well. And, and I think various fairly humdrum forms of technology coupled with people who have altruistic motivations and good kind of problem-solving skills can really make the world significantly better. And from there, right, once you've brought most of the world to the quality of life that the average person in, in Europe currently has, while maintaining most of the risks at bay from, from the ones that we currently face, the universe, the universe is the limit. I, I think that we are going to be able to colonize various parts of the solar system. I think we can make significant advances in curing many diseases uh, and extending people's meaningful lifespans. I think once you have enough of your economy relying on mostly automated uh, systems with sufficient resilience built in that you can have increasing numbers of people dedicating their lives to creative pursuits, uh, which is an extremely ex can be extremely satisfying. I think we can explore many more ways of kind of organizing social lives and so on. Yeah, I think the world can go well. I, I, I imagine things go going well without ever creating one unitary uh, super smart system that is going to optimize the world for us. Mm. Uh, I think the world probably goes better if we just give up on the notion of creating those kinds of systems uh, and instead kind of use increasingly um, smart algorithms as tools to be deployed around the world to make our lives easier and better. I think there is enough human ingenuity to make sufficient progress on most of the problems that, that face us. Uh, yeah, so I think some significant improvement in global cooperation around the biggest risks uh, and, and applying technologies really to, to address questions of, of scarcity about the most basic goods that are required, That's, that would be things going very well for us. Now, if we look at this vision and then we look at the type of enormously complex international system that we have um, and all of these different players and interactions and personalities, where would you say the, the point of leverage, the point of most leverage lies? What part of the system is, is, is key to, in your mind, top of mind to make, to, to help us get there? Is it the president of China being a good guy? Is it just general, the way our leaders think? Or what, what, where would you put the kind of point of most leverage? <laughs> uh, I actually think that, that, you know, the president of China being a good guy is, is a pretty good way of getting there. Um, that they have a, a system that uh, has various faults and limitations, which have been commented on very widely. Right. Uh, and, and by and large, I agree with those criticisms. But I think there is a lot of ability to coordinate technological progress with broadly pro-social developments in a way that can be extremely meaningful, meaningful for the world. But, but you also will need U.S. Co cooperation. And I think degree to which making an, an, the other into an enemy as a way of being uh, re-elected uh, and as a way of kind of delaying dealing with some of the really hard problems in the world, as long as that is an extremely powerful way of getting power and a relatively cheap way of getting power, uh, things are going to be hard. How do you deal with that? I mean, you need, you need extremely charismatic leaders who are as competent as using new communication methods, technologies, um, emotions, etc., to create a vision of, of, of hope, of, for creating trust. Uh, we also need technical measures that, that allow us to kind of make trust trustworthy, right? That produces the evidence such, such that if you want to be a trusted agent, you generally do need to do the trustworthy things because cheating is just technologically very hard for you. I think that there's kind of meaning, meaningful progress to be made there. So, so I think a bunch of things need to all go right for the for the problem to be solved. Right? It's not just having a few key individuals having the right kinds of motivations, 
but but I, I do think that ultimately kind of the behaviors of the US and Chinese administrations, the behaviors of some of the fairly large technology companies and platforms, and, and, and some very specific areas of, of research and, and development to provide a specific set of tools, uh, are all, which most of which probably we don't know what they are yet, uh, are all going to be fairly important. Um, and I, I think one, one thing that I kind of emerged for me from this conversation is, you know, just having the different players have humanity, the good of humanity as their aspiration, as their goal, that's above their, you know, immediate. So they, they could still care about their family and their country and, but kind of also caring about how it all fits together because now that's becoming more and more important and making sure that by, by serving your narrow interest, you're not actually destroying something that's much more important than that. Yeah, I'm, I think that's right. I think, I think more enlightened self, enlightened self-interest is useful. The, the more I play these games and I see people play these games, the more I see though that you can tell yourself a story about what, what, why you're doing is in enlightened self-interest. And that story might even be right. I mean, we're extremely, we have very poor models about how the world operates. I think there is, I mean, you have to do quite a lot of bending back around yourself. Uh, but I think there is a story to be told for why what Trump is doing is in fact best, not just for him and his children and his business empire and people who look like him, but also is in fact better for the rest of the world. Uh, I don't particularly buy that story. But I'm not sure that his motivations are entirely selfish. It, it's much easier to explain the world uh, if you assume that. But um, but I think you also need you also need to be able to produce the charitable reading and challenge the assumptions that would need to go into that. Yeah, I think that's fair. The only way you're going to convince someone who who really thinks someone like Trump is doing a great job is to assume that they are do that he is doing a great job giving a set of assumptions and then point out some of these assumptions that you know might not be quite right and that's a much more productive discussion than saying you know you're evil or you're you know the intention is not right and it's actually quite separate separate question from what we actually think Trump's motivation is uh, when you're talking to someone who who's a supporter yep uh, I mean, I, I also think that, you know, even if you go all the way up, up, up to Trump, uh, that, that's a better tool. You also tend to learn more about the world and you also maybe get a way of nuancing your own uh, view of the world in various ways. Because, right. I mean, the, the truth is not always uh, um, in your camp. I think we also need to remember that many times individuals, even at the top of fairly hierarchical organizations, are extremely limited in what range of actions they have above and beyond the institution in which they are embodied. So while, while it's very good to, to kind of get literacy about people's uh, beliefs and, and motivations, uh, both, both in a charitable and maybe simplistic and explanatory ways, we also need to have much better institutional li li literacy to understand if these people change their minds tomorrow, how much would the world in fact change? I mean, I, I would imagine the president of China is, is, is freer than the president of the United States to, uh, to follow their agenda. Maybe, but maybe. maybe it's just because we don't have sufficient literacy about internal politics within the People's Party of China. Yeah, I guess that's right. I guess that's right. Great. Okay, so Shahar, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to talk to me today. My um, pleasure, as always. Where where could people find you, or what what would you want people who listen to this to do? If you want to re read more, much more about some of this stuff, you can go and check my website, um, shaharavin.com, uh, or our, or the organization's website, cser.ac.uk. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots of material out there, and if you want to get involved, just drop me an email. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much, Shahar. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. 
It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. Uh, we run design sprints all over the world. Um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.